What's up, eco nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be looking at water pollution. Before we get started, I want to start you off with this quote. Today, everybody is either downwind or downstream from somebody else. So the core case study in this unit is Lake Washington. So a ton of sewage was dumped into Lake Washington. It was from a treated wa uh, wastewater facility, but because it was wastewater, it had a huge amount of excess nutrients. So a lot of phosphorus, uh, nitrogen waste, things like that. So in 1955, Edmondson discovered that there were cyanobacteria in the lake. And the cyanobacteria were directly related to the excess wastewater in the lake. So the more nutrients, the more cyanobacteria there were. Eventually, public pressure led to the cleanup of the lake, and this is what it looks like today. So in this unit, we're going to look at water pollution and how it causes illness and death in humans as well as other species, and it can also disrupt ecosystems. We're also going to be looking at the chief sources of water pollution, which are agricultural activities, industrial facilities, and mining. But growth in population and resource use make it increasingly worse. So just what is water pollution? Well, by definition, it's a change in water quality that can harm organisms or make water unfit for use by us, as well as other animals and plants. Contamination with chemicals, as well as excessive heat. Another type of water pollution that's not listed would actually be noise pollution, and that can affect marine mammals and their migratory patterns, as well as their breeding patterns. So looking at this graphic right here, we have untreated sewage that's going into this river. Uh, the excess nutrients from that untreated sewage can cause huge algal blooms. A lot of times that algae can actually get lodged in gills of fish, uh, things like that, and it can actually result in huge fish kills. So there are two types of water pollution. We have point and non-point sources. Non-point sources are very broad and diffuse areas. It's difficult to identify and control, and they're very expensive to clean up. So looking over here at the graphic, some of the examples of a non-point source would be cropland, because we don't know exactly where all of it's coming from. So tons and tons of chemicals are coming off of cropland and getting deposited into rivers, lakes, streams, and eventually winding up in the oceans. We also have runoff from city streets, but again, we don't know where all of that pollution is coming from or exactly what types of pollution are coming from those streets. Then we have our point sources. Point sources are located at very specific places, and they're easy to identify, monitor, as well as regulate. So right here, one of the point sources is a factory that has a direct outlet into this river. So someone can go to that point source and monitor what chemicals are being um, poured into the river. Same thing for the wastewater treatment plant right here. We can measure dissolved oxygen content. We can look at what nutrients are being released into the river. So those are very easy to monitor. Whereas the non-point sources up here, they're not very easy to monitor because it's not going to be consistent. We don't know exactly what the farmers are using. We don't know what's going on in the city streets, what type of pollution is, you know, what type of pollutants are getting put into the streets and the water that's being washed into the river. So here are some of the leading causes of water pollution. First of all, we have agricultural activities. These include sediment that's eroded from land, uh, fertilizers and pesticides that get used on all of the crops. So farmers, you know, fertilize their lands with lots of, um, you know, fertilizers that are very rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. Sometimes they contain uh, inorganic compounds. Uh, sometimes, you know, heavy metals will seep in and things like that. Um, also, from agricultural activities, we have bacteria from livestock as well as food processing wastes that can go into our water supply and make us extremely, extremely sick. Second type of water pollution is industrial facilities. These release inorganic as well as organic chemicals into the water. So, for example, we could be releasing coal ash, and this can get stored in ponds, and eventually it could get dumped into our lakes and rivers, and again, eventually wind up in our oceans. A third type is mining. This is when surface mining disrupts the land, it creates soil erosion, and we have runoff of toxic chemicals that were left over from the mining wastes. So the next pictures you're going to be looking at are from different types of polluted areas. This is a point source pollution from Gargas in France. 
So looking at that, it's you know obviously highly contaminated water, but it is a point source, meaning they know where it's coming from, they can measure it, and hopefully they can rectify it and control it. This is an example of a non-point uh, pollution source, and it's coming from sediment from unprotected farmland that flows into streams and rivers. This is a polluted lake that's been contaminated with different types of mining wastes. And as you can see here, this lake has been extremely polluted by trash. Tons of plastics, uh, different types of debris have ended up here. So major water pollutants have very harmful effect on humans as well as other animals. We have infectious disease organisms that we can get from contaminated drinking water. The World Health Organization estimates that over 1.6 million people every single year die before the age of five because of polluted water sources. So I know this is a lot right here, but I do want you guys to write down all of these examples and types into your notebooks because it is important that you know them. So over here we're going to have the type of water pollution and the effect that it has. We'll have examples and then you'll have where those sources actually come from. So we have infectious agents, which are called pathogens, and those cause diseases. So examples of those are bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and parasites. And most of them come from us and other animal wastes or feces. We have oxygen demanding wastes, and these deplete dissolved oxygen that's needed by aquatic species. So it will basically suffocate uh, fish in lakes, rivers, streams, as well as the oceans. Examples are biodegradable animal wastes and plant debris. And the major sources of oxygen demanding wastes are sewage, animal feedlots, food processing facilities, as well as paper mills. Then we have plant nutrients, and these cause excessive growth of algae and other species. Examples are nitrates and phosphates, and those are found in sewage, animal wastes, and inorganic fertilizers. So this is where you see all of the runoff coming from farm lands, and that contributes to all of the excess nitrates and phosphates, which will increase algal blooms. And then we also have organic chemicals. These add toxins to the aquatic systems. Uh, those can include oil, gasoline, plastics, pesticides, fertilizers, as well as cleaning solvents. And the sources of those include industry, farms, our, our households, uh, different types of mining sites, and runoff from streets, as well as parking lots. We have inorganic chemicals. And again, those add toxins to aquatic systems. And those can be acids, bases, salts, and metal compounds. And again, they come from industry, households, mining, runoff from streets and parking lots as well. We also have sediments. And this disrupts photosynthesis, food webs, as well as other natural processes that occur. Examples are, of course, soil and silt. And then this comes from land erosion from farms and construction, as well as mining sites. And then we have our heavy metals. Heavy metals, if we ingest too many of them, can cause cancer, they can disturb our immune systems, as well as our endocrine systems. And examples of heavy metals include lead, mercury, and arsenic. And these can be uh, originate from unlined landfills, and that's something we talked about with our waste unit. If we don't line the landfills very well, a bunch of chemicals can actually soak through and into our water supply. Uh, they can come from household chemicals, mining refuse, as well as industrial charges. And then we have thermal pollution. And this makes some species vulnerable to disease. And thermal pollution is heat. And the major sources are electric power and industrial plants. So we also have common diseases that can be transmitted to humans through contaminated drinking water. So different types of pathogen-causing agents cause different types of diseases, and they have different types of effects on our bodies. So we have bacteria, which can include typhoid fever, cholera, bacterial dysentery, and enteritis. Uh, most of those effects are going to cause diarrhea, vomiting, uh, basically severe dehydration, and they can be fatal if that person doesn't get treated or rehydrated. We have viruses such as hepatitis B, which can cause high fevers, headaches, uh, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, and it can cause permanent liver damage. And then we have poliomyelitis, which can cause fever, diarrhea, uh, lots of aches and pains, and it can affect your spinal cord and actually cause paralysis and muscle weakening. 
And then we have parasitic protozoa. Uh, that can be amoebic dysentery. And again, dehydration caused by diarrhea and vomiting. Um, it can cause liver abscesses as well as bowel perforation, uh, meaning that it can cause tears into your intestines. And eventually, of course, if untreated, death. Um, Giardia, which again causes diarrhea, abdominal cramps, uh, can cause flatulence, belching, and fatigue. And then we have cryptosporidium. That again can cause a lot of diarrhea, vomiting, cramps, um, and it can cause death to people who have weakened immune systems. We also have types of parasitic worms. We have schistomyosis, which can cause abdominal pain, rashes, uh, fatigue, and bad health as well as ankylostomiasis, which can cause severe anemia and possible symptoms of bronchial infections. So what do we actually test for when we're doing water tests? What type of pollutants are we looking at and what can we tell from those tests? Well, some of the water tests we perform are a coliform bacteria test that tells us what type of bacteria are in our water, such as E. coli, and it looks at the levels of those bacteria. We can look at the level of dissolved oxygen. We can do different types of chemical analyses. We can also use indicator species, such as cattails or mussels. Those are kind of similar to, you know, whenever people are mining coal, they used to take a canary down into the caverns with them. And that would be an indicator species of if those air conditions uh, were safe or not. Same thing with the cattails or mussels. Those are indicator species that are very sensitive to different types of pollutants. Uh, different uh, bacteria and yeast actually glow in the presence of specific toxic chemicals, so those can give us an indication that there's something wrong with the water. And we can also look at the color of the water and turbidity. And turbidity, if you recall, is going to be the clearness or the cloudiness, I should say, of the water. The more turbid the water, the more particulates are in that body of water. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy until next time.